they gathered us and they put us all in the back of a lorry. We were 95 people in it. 95. We could have, like, if something happened, this 95 people, like, if it's a car accident, we would be all dead. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. We are in uh, London, in Carnaby Street, in a restaurant at the top of Kingley Court called Imad Syrian Kitchen. And the man who has brought us this wonderful place is Imad Alana. Now he has a book about his food and his own journey. And in it, he says, my name is Imad Alana, and I was a refugee, an asylum seeker, a displaced person, an illegal immigrant. What does that make you think of? That's what we're going to explore a little today. Imad, thank you for having us. Thank you so much for coming. And, and you know, let's begin with the food that you've, you've put on a little spread for us, and it looks amazing. What do thank we have? You. So I wanted to have, like, a mixture between... Um, Damascus and London. It's all amazing, and I'm going to tuck in while we while we talk because, I mean, you called the book a love letter from Damascus to London, and that's what this is, isn't it? it? Is. I mean, this is this is your life, yep, in Syria, yep, brought to London and brought to life in London, yep. But it was a hell of a journey getting here. It was. So, so tell me first about life in Damascus. What 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 was your life in Damascus before the war? Exactly. Actually, I always like to remember my life in Damascus before the war because I don't think I had a life in in Damascus during the war. Like somehow, uh, I lost my my whole life. It's not only it's not only restaurants, houses, juice bars, coffee shops. It's not only that. I felt like somehow if I lost my my city, you know, and like it. it, it it was more than losing losing stuff. It it was much much more because I I don't know how to describe it. But I, in, let's say when 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 you see when you are in in constant zone or um, a war around you, you will be always protect that. Oh, this is gonna happen. I need to. But for us in Syria before the war, it wasn't that way. Like we had. Peaceful, uh, not only peaceful actually. It, it it was amazing. We had an amazing time in there. We built our businesses. All it of was it. a holiday place. Yeah. students would go there. All of it. All yeah. of it. Like, uh, yeah, people come to to Damascus from all over the world. The problem was, for me, it was a good life. But the problem was, it wasn't really a good life for the others. What What was your relationship? How did you think of the authorities, the police, the ministries, when you when you had your ordinary life? I mean, as you say, you had a successful life. Yes. You had restaurants and yes. few spas. Yes. But you, but you weren't free, so you lived in an authoritarian state. What what did that mean? How did that feel? So you need to you need to work your life through this authority uh, and this um, dictatorship. Uh, authority so instead of having for example when when you want to open a restaurant instead of having a regular license to it you need to pay extra to do the license and uh, i know it's a corruption but there is no other way like we don't have other way to do it like there is no uh, straightforward way uh, to to get your license instead instead you have to be in that corrupt system. I have to say this is the most delicious hummus Thank you so I've much. ever had. Thank you. Um, so the Arab Spring comes. Yep. And people start demanding their freedoms. Yep. And, and it starts with quite a small protest. Yep. What was your view of all of that? Um, I was really, really supportive. I did go to protest. I did a protest many times. But I'm not that brave person, you know, like 
okay, I will, uh, I can stand in the face of the, no, I'm, I'm not that person. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not like, I wish if I can, uh, but going on a protest in Damascus was a risky thing to do. Oh, it's, it's one of the craziest things ever. Like it's much easier to get an, uh, like to be armed than carrying on a camera. Yeah. Believe me, it's much, much easier. Like, uh, if, if you carry on a gun or you're shooting towards um, people, you will be forgiven by now. It's fine. But if you had a camera at that time, you will not be forgiven. Not now, not forever. When the revolution started in Syria, everyone talked about, about peaceful revolutions being killed by Assad. And then he wanted to change this. So no, these are armed revolution. He make it easier for them to be armed. Uh, actually, in some places, he armed them himself. So, for example, um, releasing all the ex-prisoner in, 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 in who came, terrorists who came from, from uh, fighting uh, in Iraq, and they've been jailed in Sednaya jail, they all been released. But if you are a journalist being jailed, you, you n never been released. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, so tell me about what happened when you decided you had to leave. Actually, my restaurant's been bombed in um, 2012, uh, uh, but uh, March 2012, but I didn't leave Syria until 2015. So I was hoping that things will get back, not get back to normal. Things will be better for everyone soon and Assad will be aside with no time. Uh, with all of these promises, red flags from the USA government, from the UK government, from everywhere, we thought that we're going to have a support with no time. But yeah, unfortunately, Not somehow... Okay. Nothing came, nothing, we felt like we, not, not like we've been um, left behind only, and which we did, but more importantly, we felt like we've been stamped in the back, you know, like, no, we are supporting the Syrian people with their revol a peaceful revolution. If he, uh, if Assad used chemical weapons, we're going to interfere, if he... Uh, attack Aleppo, we're going to interfere. Nothing happened. Unfortunately, Russia, Iran, Hezbollah all kept their promises, but on the other hand, no one... Uh, uh, yeah, we tracked. Like, What do you think, as a Syrian, then, when you see all the help going to Ukraine? I was supportive to Ukraine from yeah. the very beginning, uh, really supportive. But like, did it make you think, where was our help? Do you think you're a second-class refugee? Actually, I thought at the very beginning that we are all refugees, but I think uh, the three, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you can call it a second class, I think we are fifth or sixth class refugees. Even though I'm not saying that this is, has nothing to do with the Ukrainians, by the way, right? Yeah. We support where we were very supportive from the very beginning. We were in the campaign of uh, Cook for Ukraine uh, with Choose Love, of course, we support a lot. This is something different. It has, we need to define that I'm, I'm not, they are victims just like us. And the, the what makes me even, even more sad about it, that we have the same enemy you know like when when russia was bombing aleppo everyone went to the uh, world world cup in in russia and it was okay it was absolutely fine everyone went there it, but it's the same no yeah. putin now he is a criminal but when he was bombing aleppo or uh, daraha or uh, hama it's okay. Why? Just because it's like, if you're going to talk about blonde hair and blue eyes, 
we share the same blood color. Like, uh, it's all red. So when he was bombing Aleppo or any other city, he was the good Putin. And we were getting uh, the most of uh, Europe oil from it, just normal and regular. And why? And he crossed every single line in, in Syria. And uh, actually, they tried weapons in Syria I, just to try it. it. It's so exhausting to have, uh, e even in victims, you have first class and second class, which is really, yeah, devastating. So, so tell me about your decision to leave. Um, actually, I, I had it for a long time, like since 2012, I think. I somehow I did give up and I don't want to stay, but I couldn't afford to leave my family behind or to take them with me because it's both way. It's really dangerous, dangerous to, to do so. But in 2015, I couldn't take it anymore. I had a lot of problems moving. We shifted five times before we moved in. Um, it was really scary to stay in there. And it's scary for everyone, by the way, but especially for um, like men between age of 16 until 50, it's 10 times more scary because you will be in risk to be taken in every police area in the city. Um, and when I left Damascus, it was a lot. Like in, in one street, you will have four or five police barriers. I've been harassing like by them many times uh, and having a fight with someone powerful in, in Assad government, it's not a joke, even for a personal reason. like. It's really not a joke. Like you can be kidnapped in the Assad uh, jails, like without a record, just being in there for years without even, no one will know about you. Even, even the, like, even the, 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 the person who's serving you food or, or getting you, like putting you in jail, they are not allowed to know your name, just not to spread that uh information loudly so it was really scary i decided to move out from there uh, uh, on july 2015 uh sadly leaving my family behind so you you were thinking you'll go and find a safe place and then get actually i wanted to go out from syria as soon as possible uh, as I told you before, before the war start, I used to, I used to be part of that community where I have to pay this police officer this kind of money, but they would never understand that you lost your your business. They would keep asking you and asking you, and and you would be like, it's a stupid to say no. Uh, I had to say no, of course, after. So then I've decided I can't take it anymore. I literally can't take it anymore. I have to leave now. So I left to, from Syria to Lebanon. I really wanted to, to, to have a safer place to, to, to leave to. But sometimes you don't have choices. But why did you want to come to the UK? I always wanted to come to the UK uh, because I can speak English. Uh, because I have a family in here, this is another, and um, also because I'm I'm old to learn a new language. I, I, I'm not this man of languages. Like I, I, yeah, yeah, and I think it getting older make it even harder. But you you know the debate around asylum now. Yes, and the government says well people should stay in the first safe country that they come to. Yes. For you, the first safe country in theory was Lebanon. So w why not stay in Lebanon? First of all, Lebanon is not a safe country for Syrians. Uh, I think, I'm sorry, but I don't think it's even a scare, uh, safe country for the, for the Lebanese themselves. Their, their it's, it's not a safe country, period. Um, 
and um, for people are trying to leave it now. I was just in Lebanon recently. I've seen people are taking boats from Le Lebanese people. Lebanese people are taking boats from there. I'm not saying that it's the refugee uh, problems uh, and asylum seeker problems in Lebanon. It's not uh, difficult for Lebanese people. Of course, it is very difficult. And of course, it is adding to their problems a lot. But it's not the Syrians, uh, like, it, it's not our attention to become refugees. You know, like, somehow here the government trying to make it that we were happy in our countries. And then, you know what? I'm going to leave my restaurants, my coffee shops, my bars, and I want to go and be a refugee in the UK. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. It's not like I'm seeking to be, to become, it, it's, it, it's not like I'm coming, sir, or, you, you know, like it, yeah. it's not something beverage to, to be a, a asylum seeker. But I'm, I'm guessing you also want to go somewhere where you can build a life. Of course. Actually, this is the problem. After, after nine days of leaving Syria, I was in Germany. Uh, with all the respect uh, for Germany, especially, uh, especially Angela Merkel, who, who did great for the Syrian there, especially at 2015. Like, I was so lucky. I was in Stuttgart nine days after leaving Damascus. It was so fast uh, uh, journey. How? Lebanon to Turkey, Turkey to Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, Hungary, Austria, Germany, and then France, and then the UK. Did you have to pay people smuggling? Oh, yes, all the, all the way. Like, it depends. So, for example, Boats from Turkey to uh, Greece, uh, smuggler, and then walking to Macedonia. We had the train to, to Serbia and then like inside Serbia. And then we had deal with another smuggler between Serbia across Hungary to be in uh, Austria, because Hungary w at that time was really scary. So when you think about people smugglers who are now the great evil in this today, is it? do you think of them as evil or as good because they helped you? you? No, of course they are evil, but not as evil. But without them, you wouldn't be here. I know, I know, but for example, I would like, it, it was, uh, it was uh, a scary journey uh, between Turkey and uh, Greece. Yeah. They gathered us and they put us all in the back of a lorry. We were 95 people in it. 95. We could have, like, if something happened, this 95 people, like, if it's a car accident, we would be all dead. Terrifying. It is terrifying. I couldn't, like... Uh, I saw someone who vented, but he couldn't fill down because there is no way to fill up. So he being kept that way the whole journey until we arrived the, to the point yeah. where these small boats, the rapper boats, take us from one side Again, to another. You knew that people were drowning in those boats because the boats were sinking. Yes. Were you frightened? Yes. You, like... There is no, no other choice. I, I have stood on the beach in Greece yeah. and watched the boats come in. Yeah. When they come on the rocks. Where was In the Lesbos. In, oh, I went there. Really? Yeah. I, I think, I think it was probably 2015 when I was there. Really? Um, babies coming off the boats. Yes. Yeah, we were 50, People 40. People were looking absolutely terrified, really. Mine wasn't that way, actually. Uh, to be honest, I wanted to do anything but not go, not go back to that uh, trolley behind. I, I didn't want to go that back there and face that problem again. So I jumped in the, in, on the boat with a friend of mine. Um, he was uh, like, I, I'm not saying that I'm a great swimmer, but I am a swimmer. He wasn't at all. And he was so scared, so I had to take care of myself and him just to assure him that this is going to be fine, this is, it's going to be okay, and 
we were so lucky. So I think that, you know, this was an incredible journey then. So how, how did you get to Britain? So I've, I waited in Calais for 64 days. In the jungle? Not in the jungle. I was outside of the jungle, somewhere near of, near of the lighthouse. Uh, it, there is a, an old church over there and we were sleeping on the steps of that church. We stayed there for 64 days. What were you waiting for? Trying to come over here with like- uh, the, in, a, in a lorry ten, or? Yeah, ten, the first 10 days I tried in the lorry, under the lorry, behind the lorry. I mean, people have forgotten, but in those days, you know, when you went to the ferry ports, yeah. there, it was full of refugees trying to yeah. jump on the lorries. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I tried it. It was crazy. You know? I, I did try it, yeah. It wasn't an easy thing to do for me. Like um, one time I was in, that lo in, in the lorry and I've seen it myself that there is a ship, like there is a container going to, before I hid in there, yeah. I saw it myself that there is a container, uh, not a container, sorry, like a package going to Manchester. So I thought, wow, this is mine. And, I hid head, in there, yeah, after waiting there for 13 hours, I think, no, even more. Uh, the driver came in, he started to drive, five minutes later, he st stopped somewhere and started to drive again. But the, the port was like 15 minutes away, but I don't think he drove for like an hour. So what happened when he stopped five minutes after someone took that package, who's go which is going to Manchester and he drove back to, uh, Belgium. Yeah. So we ended up with that. <laughs> but eventually you got here, how same, same way. No, I got, I came here from garden old Paris to St. Pancras. How? A fake ID. A fake passport? Fake passport. How much did that cost? Five grand. So how much money did you have left? Uh, 12 pounds. When you arrived here? Yeah. You'd spent all your money coming? All here. of my money. And you couldn't get any more money out of Syria? No way. No way. Because you know it. Because you already were well I, off in Syria. I've already, I've already get a lot of support from my brother, my brother-in-law, my aunt, like, Everyone I know, everyone I know, I he, like and can be supportive. Uh, people think somehow that this uh, uh, asylum seeker or refugees are all in the same package. You know, like they are looking for, they come here to to take our jobs or our benefits. money or our benefits. Yeah, it's, we are just people like everyone else. You can't say all the Americans are good people or all the Brits are good people. I'm not saying there is none, of course, but all of them are people, a human being. So we have good people and bad people, of course. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you, you, you're now very politically critical of this government yeah. in a way that you could never have been in Syria. Of course not. In a television interview. If, if we have the same government here, like in Syria, I will take the dinghy and leave from here and go somewhere else. Yes. That's it. So what, what does the freedom to have this conversation oh my God. mean oh my to you? God. It's the whole thing. It's the whole thing. Actually, what, what makes me want to do so, I don't want to, I don't want like, I care about London so much, I don't want to see what happened in Damascus to, to happen in London. The restaurant business is notoriously difficult yep. in London. Yep. Even getting premises really hard. Yes. Have you, have you found people wanting to help you or all wanting to keep you out all the time. of this? All the time. I've been supportive from the day one in Greece when we landed on that 
ماتيليني ليزبوس I remember that old lady waving to us. She was more happy that we are safe, even more than me. I swear, she was, you can look at her face. Then when I asked about her, she was from Norway and trying to, uh, she, she was going back to Norway yeah. when she saw our port and she thought, okay, this is my last port. I'm gonna uh, support and help before I go back to Norway. And people in London, the same? Amazing. Amazing, uh, I, uh, you know, before before we opened this restaurant, we raised more than 200,000 pounds for the charities as a catering company. But I didn't have enough money to open the restaurant. I was like, I needed 50K to, to, to open the whole list. We had it like in, in, in days, on GoFundMe, I had the whole amount, and it was all just from donors, from just from donors. ordinary people, just, th just like that, because they wanted to support. So, so what is your future now? Is it you're you're a Londoner? Oh, I've been Londoner since the day one. You know, I had first of all, I had my passport a few months ago, uh, the British passport, which is super proud of, but. I've been Londoner from the day one. It's not about, it's not up to anyone to give you this status. You it's adopted about, London. It, it, it's, you know, um, when, when I lost my city, Damascus, back in there in Syria, I was ready and looking for a new city, you know, to love and to be in that city. But somehow, everywhere I went before London, People were looking at you, judging you with backpack and, oh, this is the, like, of course, they, they didn't say anything, but maybe in my mind, they were like, this is another Syrian refugee who come here to take our jobs or, you know. And how many people do you give jobs to here now? Uh, 26. W when I arrived here to the King's Cross, no one looked at me. I was invisible. You know, everyone looks so different. So I was really scared at the very beginning, but they make it so easy. Everyone's so different. No one look at you. And do you remember how much tax you paid last year? Uh, yes, a lot. A lot? Yes, a lot, a lot. So you give back quite a lot to this country? Yes. If you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? The whole world. You can be as small or as big as you like. I would love if people will look at me and see me as everyone else. I, I don't want people to be equal. We didn't, we didn't born and raised to be equal. I just want people to deal with each other like, like if you're dealing with everyone else. I don't want to look at you and see your what you're thinking or what your background or what did you study or I just want to deal with you like a normal person and you act with me exactly the same. I don't want to go to uh, this city and people looking at me like if I'm coming from another planet, you know, yeah. I don't want to go to if, if there is anything I can change, I will I don't want people to sit down in, in motels, which is, there is jails in, 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 in the UK much better than these motels and call them names and accusing them that they are ruining our economy, doing nothing just because they don't have status, where I need them here in, in, in my, in my restaurant. We have. So just treat you like people. Yeah. Doctors, like they are respected, well known and uh, really hard-working doctors, they could make a difference in, 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 in someone's life. But instead, no, they were left behind because we somehow, we look at people as numbers. You have 10,000 refugees, uh, asylum seekers. They are not numbers. They are human beings just like me and you. 
I don't know what you did to have this privilege to live comfortable life and someone like why you deserve why why you deserve this and even if you did something great and you deserve it why you don't think about these other people it might have been a pleasure I could talk to you for hours but you got um, customers arriving thank you so I believe much. yes and I'm gonna eat some more of this food please do so thank you so much thank for you sharing so much. your well the way you changed your world thank you so much thank you